Why is Rob such a dork? Why is Jess such a geek? Who was the first to nincompoop? And what makes someone a cumber world? Brace yourselves, because today we'll hurl our best insult origins at you freaky etymology dweebs on Words Unraveled. Watch out. Welcome to another Words Unraveled. I'm Rob Watts from the YouTube channel Rob Words. And I'm Jess Seferis, author of the etymology books Once Upon a Word and Words from Hell, and today we etymology simps are throwing some serious shade with insults of today and yesterday. Yes, this pair of nincompoops is about to slap you down with the etymology of insults. Actually, that's probably a good place to start, isn't it, Jess? The etymology of insults, or at least the word insult itself. Let's do this. It's it's funny. It's actually cognate with the word assault. So it's a surprisingly violent word. And both of them trace back to the Latin salire, meaning to leap. So both of oh. these words, assault and insult, mean to leap at someone, either verbally or physically. Like some assault then? Yeah, exactly. Do you have a favorite insult? What's the one that you like to, to bring out when someone <sighs> gets on the wrong side of Jess of Faris? Oh, I'm I'm actually I'm I think I'm I'm too mild. Um <laughs> <laughs> in generally speaking, I like most people. Um, I do like, you know, the usuals. Um, one of my favorite phenomena in the insult world um, is the compound insult. Um, and, and one of my favorite things that's ever happened on the internet is um, Colin Morris in 2022, this programmer named Colin Morris, who is a regular Reddit user, assembled the most common, like a grid of the most common compound insults on Reddit. Um, and so like you would match like one word like fart with uh, another word like muffin or goblin or waffle <laughs> or nugget. So you end up with, you know, fart nugget. And some of them, like some of them are more obvious. Some that we see together like ass clown. That's that's a good common compound insult. But other ones, you know, you might you might run into like snot nozzle occasionally. And the more unexpected they are, the funnier they get. What's exciting about this is that we're still innovating when it comes to insults. As we always have, it's always been a great source of innovation down the years. We've had some very creative insults down the centuries. We have. And, and like, so this happens a lot. Um, insults change their intensity and they, they decide to not be insults. They decide to be insults. Um, and we've talked about this on a previous episode. But when a word goes from being insulting or pejorative to not insulting or not pejorative, that's called amelioration. And that happens towards like queer, which used to be an insult and now has been reclaimed by the LGBTQ community. Um, and then the summer, we see that happening with the word brat. Have you heard this like brat summer? Um, I, have, I have come across <laughs> it. Yeah, I've still not really pinned down what it actually means uh, other than just, I don't know, it's, it, well, no, you should explain it. I I'm feel honestly... like this is this is I feel like this is this is a female domain and you should explain what Brad is. I'm not cool enough to actually like pin down exactly what it means, but basically Charlie XCX released an album that has popularized this term and affiliated it with um the color like a particular shade of green that's being called brat green it's all de designed to be deliberately uneasy on the eye right That's yeah it's like it's like a, a twist on on hot girl summer but more intrusive and more in your face and uh i don't know i think embracing all of your perhaps negative qualities you're proud of yeah i mean there's been an awful lot of commentary on this word it's clearly the the word of the season so let's mm -hmm. let's do what we do best and <laughs> look at the words from from way back old-fashioned insults. I've got one or two old-fashioned insults that we don't use anymore that I think are worth a mention. Can I go All right, let's them? hear it. Mm -hmm. Well, so have you ever heard of anyone being called a Cumberworld? A Cumberworld? A Cumberworld or Cumberwald? Cumberworld. Yeah. No, I haven't. It sounds so, like an article of clothing. Yeah, it does. It sounds, <laughs> it sounds kind of cozy or snuggly. What do you think? Like a big jumper, a cumber world? Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about the word encumbrance, you start to get a lot closer to, mm -hmm. to what it means. Because what a cumber world was, was someone who was essentially taking up an unnecessary amount of space on this planet. They were an encumbrance to the rest of us. That's fantastic. And oh, that's good. The interesting etymology here is in the word cumber, which actually goes back to the Latin 
cumulus, which we know as a cloud. But what that actually means is, is a heap, right? Cumulus. So a cumulus could be something in the road that is blocking you, a very deliberate sort of pile of, of rocks or something like that. So from there, we get the idea of an encumbrance or being encumbered because you're being blocked by this, this pile of rocks. Um, but also a cumulus cloud is a big sort of pile of fluffiness in the sky. That's fabulous. But obviously the sort of king of the old fashioned insult is, is William Shakespeare. And I want mm -hmm. to show you, uh, I've got a prop. Oh, fabulous. This one's courtesy of my dad who got me it for, for Christmas. It's a mug and you should be able to see if you're watching the video. Uh, it's covered in Shakespearean in in insults. Mm -hmm. ta -da, ta -da. Let me read you through a few of my favorite ones. Actually, there's one that I really, really like. This is so withering. I desire we may be better strangers. <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> oh, fabulous. Other ones, all eyes and no sight. Lump of foul deformity, which is mm, not terribly nice, is it? Roast mm. meat for worms. Yeah, I, actually, I'm not so sure. Is that an, is that an insult? It's more of just a description. Uh, anointed sovereign of sighs and groans. <laughs> Incredible. Most of these, uh, especially like the single phrase ones, um, are probably Falstaff quotes, right? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Because he Does... has these huge, especially in like the history plays, these huge rants just full of insults like starveling elf skin, dried meat's tongue, bulls, pizzle, stock, fish, oh, for the breath to utter. What is <laughs> what is like the uh, you tailor's yard, you sheath, you bowcase, you vile standing tuck. And then another one is um, you scullion, you rampalion, you fustilarian, I'll tickle your catastrophe. Oof, what a fusillade of insults. <laughs> it's the ability to to just coin them in this way is, is, is one, of the, one of the great things about Shakespeare. I mean, one of many things. This is a pre-Shakespearean tradition, though. Flighting is the, the sport of like hurling insults at one another. And one of the earliest examples we have is the flighting of Dunbar and Kennedy, which was thought to be published around like 1400, 1500, and details this huge face off between the court poet and the parson. Um, and it involves lines like, uh, and this is uh, more like modernized, but uh, cursed croaking crow, I shall gar crop thy tongue croaking, and thou shall cry cormundum on thy knees. Oof. This is like eight mile or something mm -hmm. like that. And then in Old Norse Eddic poetry also like celebrated the exchange of insults. One of my favorites though is a um, 13th century Middle English poem called um, The Owl and the Nightingale. And it is literally like, a, it's like a rap battle between an owl and a nightingale being like, your voice is ugly. No, your voice is ugly. Why are you singing all night? Why are you singing all day? It's fantastic. Highly recommend looking that one up. That's funny actually, because nightingale literally means night singer, doesn't it? But right. I think uh, I think the argument really is that like the nightingale sings all the time and the owl is like, well, <laughs> give it a rest. You're annoying. <laughs> <laughs> oh. A nice thing about English is that basically, well, and this is probably true for any language, but anything can be an insult because body language can convey insults too. Um, insult signals, according to scholar Desmond Morris, who's like primarily a zoologist, but also publishes books about human sociobiology, wrote about insult signals that fall into 10 categories, uninterest, boredom, impatience, superiority, deformed compliments, mock discomfort, rejection, mockery, and then symbolic symbols, which I believe means like hand gestures. You know, this actually reminds me of um, something called drunkenims. It's something that I wrote about in a recent newsletter because it's been said in the past, there's a comedian called Michael McIntyre who had a bit in one of his uh, comedy um, sets where he talked about how a posh English person can use just about any word to mean drunk. Oh, I believe it. <laughs> we can talk about being blottoed or plastered or hammered or smashed, but he suggests that you could claim to be utterly gazeboed or <laughs> thoroughly car parked <laughs> like these. And it is true, actually. You, you put a, at the end of just about anything and it, 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 you create a, a passable word for being very drunk. I don't know. What's, what's, what's this? I've been absolutely thoroughly mugged totally mugged no actually that's a thing already mugged. that doesn't work <laughs> hold on no i need to come up with a better one i could do this what, what have i got behind me lamped no, no that lamped. means hit oh we have that oh, we've already used them all up 
okay, this isn't my, oh, okay. I've been thoroughly plugged. No, last night I was thoroughly plugged. There you go. Amazing. I feel like that one could be a euphemism for something else too, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it could. And by the way, how many insults are based around that particular act? Oh, absolutely. I recently discovered that what's considered quite a mild insult in Britain uh, is, is actually way more sexual than I'd previously thought. Which one? Plonker. That sounds less like sex to me than other acts that are also, you know. Yeah. Well, let me tell you the story of Plonker. So I tend to think of it as very British. Mm? Do you use it in the United States? It's not one that comes up a lot. Well, it was actually invented by Australian soldiers fighting in the First World War in Europe, incidentally. Mm. So it's not it's not British, even if I think of it like that. And you know how the, the verb to plonk means to put something down kind of unceremoniously, to kind of to slam it down, to drop it down, right? mm -hmm. to let something fall. Well, these Australian soldiers use that word to describe artillery fire, artillery shells, that you would call them plonkers because they would oh. plonk down on the ground all around them. It's, you know, it, it's making light of something extremely terrifying, I would imagine. Right. Uh, but these things are sort of missile shaped and inevitably the word plonker then starts to refer to a certain part of the male anatomy. That'll from... happen. <laughs> inevitably, it always does. <laughs> And then they start to use this phrase to pull one's plonker. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, which is uh, <laughs> describes a, a private male pastime uh, is one way I would describe it. And so to describe someone as a plonker is the, is the same as to describe them as a tosser or to describe them as, and I I'll, I'll decide later whether to beat this, wacker. And so the word actually it is, is, is very smutty, but mm -hmm. its meaning has softened sufficiently that there is a primetime comedy show from, uh, well, the 1990s, 1980s, 1990s, called Only Fools and Horses, where, you know, basically the catchphrase, one of the main characters is you plonker Rodney. And, and you know, you were talking about amelioration, yeah, so it, it seems like it went through a, a stage of pejoration where yes. it becomes more aggressive and then ameliorated itself again. Exactly. Yeah, mm. so that's the origin of plonker. It's from those plonking bombs of the, you know, the 1910s. A lot of like mild insults we use now were either like more clinical or more legal in the past, especially words for like mental illness and disability, like calling someone an idiot was an actual like legal designation for a while. Um, and same with like lunatic and things like that. And they've become, I mean, it's not polite to call anyone those things, but they are often used more in a more of a mild way and less yeah. seriously than they used to be. Yeah, there are a lot of words that were, 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 were scientific terms. Uh, there's one that I, I'm thinking of, they, there used to be a, an organization called the Spastic Society in England, which is now a charity called Scope, I believe, if they haven't changed their name since uh, since I last looked into this a while ago. But but that word spastic was a perfectly sort of scientific word until uh, it started to be misused in playgrounds and elsewhere and yeah. uh, became unusable anymore. Yeah, same with the the or the term like mental retardation and the shortening of that, which is a lot ruder now. Um, and and now that's because it's been in, uh, used as an insult for so long. It's not a word that we use in clinical environments as much anymore. Yeah, but you can see that word in other languages without any of the stigma that it has right. in English. Imbecile is another interesting word mm -hmm. actually, because to be imbecile or imbecile was a you know a, a, a very standard word for something that was enfeebled or debilitated to the Victorians it was that but actually the word goes back like 2000 years like the Romans were using imbecilus uh, as a as an insult I mean it goes back a really long way the root of imbecile um it's it's not 100% known but um the the most likely explanation is that it's from the Latin baculum meaning like walking stick so someone who doesn't have a walking stick or lacks the support and Therefore, is I mean, it means like enfeebled, basically. Uh, okay, so it's someone who ideally would have a walking stick, but doesn't have it, and therefore perhaps a mental one. 
yeah a metaphorical okay. walking they're, stick so to they're, speak they're lacking the crutch that that gives them the support they need mm -hmm. that's interesting lots of words for uh mental disabilities have turned into insults over time or um or too many insults have like become focused on mental health which is interesting like uh daft too is another one um moron of course turned into a pejorative after being more of a I'm not exactly clinical term, but perhaps used in some environments. I use the word daft quite a lot. What's the story behind that? It originally meant like gentle or mild, but was extended to mean like soft witted or dull during like the next few centuries after I think it first showed up in the 13th century. So it's a very old word, but I, my understanding is it's pretty mild too. Like it's not one that people would consider um, to be that insulting. No, it's quite a loving insult actually. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're daft apeth or your, uh, your daft little thing. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's, it's kind of endearing way of telling someone they're being a little bit foolish. I tend to use um, dork with the same degree of heat. Like if I'm calling someone a dork, I, I love them dearly, but. <laughs> What's the origin of dork? I've heard stories about dork. I, I mean, I remember hearing stories about what dork actually meant when I was at school, but. Right, on, the, the one me, we heard in straight. school was, the one we heard in school was that it has to do with like whale pieces yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. whale anatomy yeah indeed a whale's plonker it probably was affiliated with anatomy but not specifically a whale um it's probably just a variation of the word dick <laughs> <laughs> oh i did again i just wasn't expecting that I, sometimes things just take me by surprise and that one just might don't. have to bleep me occasionally <laughs> well, uh, but why has it come to mean what it means that's that's what i i wonder that it's got this sort of specific meaning of someone who's almost, uh, I don't know, too intelligent for their own good. I wonder if some words that are kind of structured like this and have that sort of blunt sound are um, tend to become insults. Another one is like chump. That's not like, that's not a very heated insult nowadays, but it's from the old Norse kumba, which meant, meant a uh, block of wood. So someone who is a chump is literally a blockhead. And I wonder if maybe there's a sense of like onomatopoeia with some of these where you end up being affiliated with like things that are, are like, I don't know, either genitalia or square stuff. <laughs> There are some rules around words that become insults. For example, we, there are pejorative endings that we don't necessarily realize we're using in English. And one of them appears in the word bastard, um, which is one of my favorites. It's a cool one. Um, so in most cases, the ending A-R-D or A-R-T is used to intensify words. It can mean like too much or too intense. So like a drunkard is someone who drinks too much. A braggart is someone who brags too much. A dullard is someone who's quite dull or very stupid. Ah, uh, yeah. Interestingly, it also appears in the word wizard, who is literally someone who is very wise, obviously not an insult, but it still has that same intensity. You'll see that ending on, on a ton of other words that are supposed to be a little bit negative, even like buzzard, which is like a, a, a bird that, that is not one that you want to see every day. What about mustard? Is exactly. That... Okay. So, so must is like the dregs of wine in the winemaking process. It's like the seeds and crushed up stuff in the winemaking process, but also the seeds and crushed up stuff that might go into a condiment, you know, how um, mustard is made up of ground mustard seeds. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's the ARD on that, that word is meant to intensify or imply the intensity of the flavor. Um, so it is must with an intense flavor. It is extremely musty. Super mm -hmm. musty is mustard. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> Absolutely. What about, is coward another one? Yes, and kind of. Um, mm. So yes, it does have that ending on it. Technically, it doesn't imply that the confusing one here is it, it sounds like it's implying someone who cowers too much, right? Yeah. But apparently it is not related to cower. Um, but instead where it comes from the Latin word cauda or tail, like a coda in music. And uh, the idea is someone who like tucks their tail and runs, which is kind of neat. But it was by virtue of folk etymology conflated with cowering. This, yeah, because this is one of those ones where actually the the association with the idea of being cowed or cowering mm -hmm. fits better than... Actually, oh, I mean, the one about the tail, that sounds like the rubbish. It does. It does. It sounds silly. I think uh, I think the folk etymology wins out on this right? one. But bastard. I, I wanted to get back to that one because oh, like, what is, what yes, is bast, right? It's from an old French word meaning pack saddle son. 
And the idea here is like your saddle or your horse blanket while you're traveling doubled as a bed. Um, and a, a pack saddle sun might be one that you conceive with someone while you're traveling on the road away from home. Um, and uh, with perhaps a person that wasn't your spouse. This is a, a feast de bast, right? Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. And actually the most famous of all bastards is William himself, right? William <laughs> the Conqueror. Yeah, mm -hmm. indeed. A huge impact he's had on the English language. But uh, before he was known as William the Conqueror, he was solely known as uh, Guillaume le Batard. Although actually he wouldn't have been called Guillaume. He was, you know, he was a Norman, so he would have been called William. But uh, yeah, William, William the Bastard. I don't know if that was a name given to him by people who liked him or who didn't. <laughs> Yeah, that's hard to say because of its like dual meanings. It's uh, factual, it can right? also just be a factual word. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's not an, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be an insult, even though it's clearly a little derisive, isn't it? To call someone a you know a pack saddle son, right? And that means yes. that I can now use the default little caption that pops up. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a thing where I explain here something very, very technical about the production of this do it, do podcast it. <laughs> and this video, but I edit these things together. And occasionally, as I will make happen right now, a thing pops up at the bottom. And every time I have to change the text in that, but when I first put it in, there is just a word that is the text, a sort of default bit of text. You know, it could just say place text here, but it doesn't. What it says, because of a discussion that Jess and I had a very, very long time when we were first starting out on the podcast. The thing that it says is bastard, right? Amazing. And it gives me a little heart attack every time I put it in, <laughs> but then I very quickly change it and it's fine. It's just because it's a, a default and I haven't got around to, to changing it. But the last time I was editing an episode, I accidentally dragged one of those into the episode and then could not find it again. So I spent ages trying to seek it out. And if not, what would have happened is that at some point during that podcast, the video version of it, the word bastard would have popped up underneath either you or I, and it would have looked like a very rude bit of commentary from the editor. <laughs> I love that. I love that our earliest discussion permanently embedded an insult into your program. Yeah, I guess you told me the story about the thing you just told me before. <laughs> it, it, it's it, it's somewhere buried in in the back there, and that must have been why it is. But it's very interesting to hear about it again. I came across another sort of custard based um, insult, actually. Custard based insult. Yeah, yeah. What's well, we're that? on to odds. <laughs> did we mention custard as an? A, oh, we an didn't. ARD we word. didn't. Tell me about custard. Well, <laughs> I, it, it, it's not really that interesting, and I don't. It's not something that cusses too much. <laughs> I know that much. But a custard was originally a, a type of of pie, right? Hmm. So we now kind of actually. What do you use the word custard to mean in the states? Does it mean it's the same the, as it means like, in England? creamy stuff yellow uh, creamy yeah, stuff yeah. That you, you might put stick it in out. in pastries and in pies and things yeah and yeah yeah tarts. and you have it hot not necessarily a custard tart can be cold but there are also custard pies that are served warm so when we talk about like a custard tart or or an egg custard which is a which is a popular little snack uh, in england what we're actually describing there is just a custard we should just be calling that a custard not a custard tart or a custard pie right because the pastry is a, what is part of the original uh, custard okay. mm -hmm. dish. Uh, and why does cowardy custard or quaking custard, which is an old insult that sadly no longer with us, but we can by all means bring back. Uh, well, why is that an insult? And it's because, well, one, because the thing is yellow, I think, although I couldn't actually find anything saying that, but mm. it seems like it must be if you're talking about cowardice and you're citing something yellow, but it, it's actually, it's just down to the way that the custard wobbles a little bit when it sets. <laughs> huh. That's funny. I yeah, like that. Wobbly, cowardy, quaking custard. Yeah. <laughs> One insult that I think that our uh, American viewers and listeners will like uh, to hear about is um, Nimrod, because they'll probably bring this up even if we don't. Originally, this was uh, a, it's a reference to the biblical character Nimrod, who was a, a renowned hunter, um, but it shows up in Looney Tunes cartoons uh, in, in relation to Elmer Fudd is called a Nimrod. And it's 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 used as an insult and it's meant to be ironic, like to call 
Elmer Fudd in particular in Nimrod is to ironically compare him to a great hunter. Now, whether Nimrod from the biblical text was actually a hunter, I think is debated. Um, some say he's also like the founder of the tower, the builder of the Tower of Babel, but I am not a biblical scholar and will probably not try to be an authority on that. But it was actually before Elmer Fudd came around that Nimrod was first affiliated with like cartoony hunters. There was a character in several pieces of pop culture, several plays called Nimrod Wildfire, who was a caricature of Davy Crockett. And he appeared in like a few different plays from the mid 1800s. And, and he would have been also probably familiar to some viewers of the cartoon when it came out. I actually have never heard of it. All right. Well, well, the, I guarantee our our American viewers will have heard of calling him like what a what a Nimrod um, is is very uh, American, like 1960s. Now, another one that has a biblical connection, or at least a theory, biblical theory, is nincompoop. You know about this one, right? I do. Yeah, I described us both as nincompoops up top because it's not particularly violent insult, is it? But it's an insult with a, a few different theories, each of which I really like. Um, they're all fun. They're all, this is a, they're it's all a great good one. fun. Yeah. The mm -hmm. biblical one is that the word nincompoop comes from Nicodemus, the Pharisee, whose basic role in the Bible is to ask Jesus stupid questions. It's a little bit of a leap, but yeah, it's kind of that. I mean, but where, where does the poop come from, for example? I mean, it's, it's a hilarious syllable, but at the same time, you, you can't just pluck these things out of thin air. So maybe if it's not Nicomodus, maybe it comes from the Latin non compos mentis, which means of sound mind. People will perhaps know that one because uh, you know, it sometimes gets used these mm. days. And, and possibly if it is from non compos mentis, it's maybe been influenced somewhat by the more regular insult ninny, which, you know, is, mm -hmm. is like a fool or a wally. So you end up with a, a nincompoop as a sort of bastardization. Huh? Yeah. Ninny is short for innocent, right? Like if you're a ninny, you're like, you're so innocent in, a, in like a. <sighs> that makes um, total sense. Naively stupid way. Mm -hmm. There we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So that's where, that's where ninny comes from. Um, Nincompoop. I found a lot of fun citations from Nincompoop, even if we didn't get to the bottom of where it comes from. Incidentally, it's sometimes written as Nickampoop. And we've talked about how Nick comes up a lot as a sort of reference to, to the devil as well. So I, I don't know. That's interesting. But one citation I found was on a, a list of occupants for a ship of fools from the 17th century. And it describes how the vessel is richly laden with asses, fools, jackdaws, ninny hammers, coxcombs, slender wits, shallow brains, paper skulls, simpletons, nick and poops, wiseacres, dunces, and blockheads. Man, that was that was comprehensive. Not bad, eh? <laughs> you could try spitting those out in your eight mile. <laughs> You're flating. But also while I was looking for citations of nink and poop, I found another one where someone referred to someone else as a nink and poop or pitiful lousy Tom Farthing. Tom Farthing, I've heard of that. You heard of that as an ins as an as an insult? Is it a character yeah. in something? Yes, um, he's. But imagine if your name is Tom Farthing. You're watching and listening to this, and you're just finding out that your name in full is an insult. <laughs> you know, I can't find it. I, I this this is this is. I didn't initially find anything for it when I first. Something had a look. is coming to mind. Like I've heard something about Tom Farthing, and I. Uh, it I sounds Dickensian, it doesn't it? Right. <laughs> oh, poor little Tom Farthing having to take up with the boy thieves. Right. Or like a, a Jack Spratt type character. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That as well. Another fun insult that I think has a, a cool origin and is embedded with insulting gestures too is a uh, sycophant. Ooh. A sycophant is, of course, like an obsequious flatterer um, who bows and scrapes to earn the approval of someone they consider important. It comes from the Greek word for fig. And uh, in Greek, psychophantes meant someone who shows the fig, which is a rude hand gesture, presumably meant to imply like female genitalia. Um, now, like 
showing the fig and the connection here, you know, you might just be calling someone that particular body part. But one of the theories that I have heard is that like the gesture became affiliated with servile follower types because ancient Greek politicians considered themselves to be above such rude gestures, but they weren't above encouraging their report or their supporters to taunt the opposition with rude gestures during, you know, in the political arena, which, you know, sounds sounds like today too. <laughs> I see. So the sycophant would show the fig to the opponents of the person whose ass they just happen to be licking at that moment. Apparently so. This is this is the story that I have read. Whether that is true or not, it does sound a little fanciful. Um, it sounds like one of those those tales we hear, but um, it's got to come from somewhere. I'm here for it. I like the stories, whether they're true or not. That is half the fun of it. <laughs> I would like to move on to nerd. Can you tell me what shirt you're wearing right now, Bob? <laughs> yes, I am. Did you spot it? <laughs> oh, hold on. Oh. Oh, uh, perfect. Nerd. For Can our listeners, see? it is an adorable shirt from uh, Rob's shop that says word nerd on it over a cute illustration of a uh, typewriter. Yeah, if you want to see it, just you should just head over to, uh, you know, robwords.com slash shop and you'll see a, a picture of it there. And while you're there, maybe you want to, I want to buy one. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, very fashionable, very demure. But the interesting thing there is I'm wearing it with pride, um, which is unusual because nerd is an insult. What's right. going on? Well, it's, I mean, I think we've we've also thoroughly ameliorated that insult, especially among those of us who take pride in our collection of <laughs> etymological knowledge yeah. or any other kind of knowledge. But anyway, this uh, this is like a relatively recent in terms of like what we talk about insult. It's it's at least, it's only about 100 years old, give or take. It was originally spelled nert at one point, and it's probably like a slang variation of nut, maybe introduced on college campuses. It has especially been applied to like people who were super into their studies um, in academic environments. Um, ah. It also, interestingly, appears in Dr. Seuss's book, If I Ran the Zoo, as a name for an imaginary creature, but the book is not thought to have dramatically influenced the frequency of the insult. Anyway, um, another word that we sometimes use for someone who's passionate about something or, and especially will also like brand themselves uh, with this insult is geek, right? Yeah. Uh, do you know anything about the origin of this one? No, I have no idea. So it's probably from a Dutch word meaning fool or something, or from a Scandinavian term meaning to mock. But in the 20th century, it was used to refer to an attraction, like a circus attraction or sideshow attraction, where a performer ate or bit off parts of live animals, like eating the heads of chickens or eating snakes. This was also like especially popularized. It existed before this, but it was popularized by the film Nightmare Alley in the 1940s. They made a remake of it recently, which I really enjoyed. So when people are wearing, walking around with t-shirts with geek written across them, they're essentially walking around with a t-shirt that says, I bite parts off animals. So after the 1940s, over the next few decades, it was applied sort of in the same word that we, or the same way that we use the term freak. Like if you're a something freak, it's a more insulting way of saying that you're very into something. People use it like Jesus freak or or um, something like that, where they're very into something. And, and that definitely still remains relatively pejorative unless somebody is so into something that they're willing to be affiliated <laughs> With yeah, the I, term freak. I think I, I think there's been a certain amount of amelioration or amelioration of that word. I think some people could describe themselves as, oh, you know, oh I'm just such a book freak. Mm -hmm. Plus, it's been affiliated with like consensually fun, naughty things too, like get getting freaky, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get, getting freaky does not mean like um, <laughs> right. growing an extra head. But originally that meant like being into things that were outside of the ordinary for the bedroom. So same idea here. Geek was applied as an insult. Like if you were very into a particular topic, like computers in particular, geek was first applied to people who were like very into computers in their early days, um, especially by like the 1990s tech boom. Um, and then in the 1980s before that and, and so on and so forth. I feel a bit bad about how the word geek has kind of been stolen off the real geeks. You know, right. People absolutely. calling themselves geeks now just because they, they wear glasses. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, and I think that that was it is just like because tech has become such an intricate and uh, involved part of our lives. Um, they've got sexy people with social skills now who can work computers. Yeah. Right. And we also like I think we're better now about like celebrating our passions rather than like maligning people for them in some cases. <laughs> 
We're oh, not yeah. always so good about that. But we have shown during the course of this podcast that uh, there can be a lot of fun <laughs> in the maligning of people too. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I would love to close with just a brief discussion about George Puttenham, an English writer and critic from the 1500s who dissected different types of rhetoric, including mm. lots of ways to communicate disdain, sarc sarcasm, and mockery in the art of English poesy. Um, mm. And some of my favorite uh, insulting varieties are micturismus, which literally means a turning up of the nose, which he also called the fleering frump. Uh, there's also <laughs> <laughs> carriantismus, which means like an expression of a disagreeable thing agreeably also called the privy nip like when you give this is almost like a, a backhanded compliment when you give a, a mock under smooth and lowly words <laughs> how he described it there's also um sarcasmus literally sarcasm um or the bitter taunt um and then aestheziasmus um which is the merry scoff or the civil jest actually i already knew all of that jess because i just read it in your book words from hell and if we're going to give my t-shirt a plug we should give your book a plug as well where can people get a hold of a copy of words from hell because i got it right right away when it first came out last year i ordered it from america not realizing that i would soon be able to get it you know from europe for much cheaper but <laughs> never mind <laughs> <laughs> well i certainly appreciate that um you can get it at any major bookseller um, or via their websites, Amazon, the usuals. But I also like to direct people to bookshop.org because that website supports indie booksellers. Wonderful. As well, we should. On that, shall we to Plonkers sign off? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> this has been a, a dreadfully fun podcast episode. <laughs> and I look forward to hearing some of our followers favorite insults and don't forget to like and subscribe we'll see you geeks next time